Welcome to the Standard of Truth podcast, hosted by historian Dr. Garrett Dirkmott, where we explore the early days of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints and gain rare historical insights into how a young farm boy was able to establish a new church and grow it by way of visions, manifestations, and miracles. Hi, welcome to another episode of the Standard of Truth podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Garrett Dirkmont, and I'm joined by my friend, Professor Richard LaDuke. Hello, Garrett. Uh, This podcast is our 4th of July spectacular podcast. Hopefully, uh, you're going into the 4th of July weekend and you have wonderful plans. We're here to tell you about the early church's feelings on the 4th of July. Um, But before we get to that, we received an email that we wanted to, to read. Uh, This comes to us from Tanner. In December, seven months ago, I emailed you and asked you if you could discuss the violence in Missouri and why it occurred. I've waited through conversations about rice tariffs and townships, just hoping I would hear the desired topic in my lifetime. Well, first of all, that's just just pausing really quickly. You hoping that you'd hear it in your lifetime. I mean, you're really wishing on a star there. Well, I don't know. For all I know, Tanner's 97, 98 (laughs) years old. I mean, I, I think you're being a little ageist in your assumptions that maybe he's maybe he's 99 years old and he's. Oh no no no! I'm just saying. I'm just saying that he's he was really had, showed a lot of hope that he would ever hear it. Ah, well, he could have been 11, and there's a lot of misplaced hope on on a lot of listeners' part. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I mean, right now they, they they said I thought we were going to talk about something important, especially Tanner. Even as I'm reading his email, he's like, "Oh, geez. He's like, "Why did I email?" Then finally, the first episode arrived. I anxiously anxiously listened through five long episodes and finally got my answer. We don't know. I guess you did try to warn me. On a serious note, thank you for just addressing the Missouri topic. Uh, Not just for addressing the Missouri topic, but for all you do. I've learned so much. I appreciate having a more complete picture of the early Missouri era era and and knowing that even the Prophet Joseph didn't have all the answers. I wish we had those journal entries in our scriptures. It has always, uh, uh, it has allowed me to have a more eternal view of the era. I am excited for the episodes about the second era of Missouri violence. So now, one of the reasons that we read that is, first of all, thank you very much, Tanner, for sending the email. Again, because it's a positive one. It, we only read the positive ones. But uh, we get th- hundreds of emails a day. All negative. <laughs> all of them. All of them asking Almost us, all why are you on the air? <laughs> That's right. Um, but the reason we bring this particular one up is, Garrett, you just got back from the state of Missouri. Yes, I was in misery. We don't want to... We don't want to pronounce it in no absolutely. incorrectly because then we'll get another another set of emails that we'll have to respond to. But yeah, um, I was just uh, uh, with a with a group. We went to um, various of the the church sacred sites, and it, 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 it there's something about going to these places where these events actually took place. You know, it's one thing to just read and study about these things, and it's quite another the feeling that you have when you're when you go to them. Um, you go to the the temple site where they dedicated uh, they dedicated the temple to be built in the land of Zion in Missouri. But before that, we we actually went to uh, went to the various church history places in the east as well. We went to Harmony and and Palmyra and Fayette, and you know when you're when you're out walking in the sacred grove or when you are there in the grand and print shop or when you're, you're, you're on the hill Camorra, it, you have a special feeling because you, you study these things and you think about them and you read about them. And when you go to the actual place, I I feel like it's kind of like, um, it's kind of like the difference between reading the transcript of a letter Joseph wrote and then reading the actual handwritten copy of the letter that he wrote, there's there's something about the original that there's there's a greater power in it. Now it's a lot harder to read, right? I mean, plus there's a lot more spelling errors and whatnot. But but there's a power in the I don't know in all, in, in getting back to that original. So um, it was it was awesome. I had a great time with some great people, and um, we. Um, you know, went to Nauvoo and, and, uh, met, 
you know, some other great folks there. So it was, it was awesome. Um, we, uh, uh, my, my son Kai was, was taught how to play various card games by Denise and Nate and, and her family. <laughs> um, and you know, I, I still think that he'll be working off whatever debt that he <laughs> lost to you. I was told that it wasn't for, for gambling, but then, then Denise sent us a bill. So that was, that was odd. It was odd that, uh, I'm not sure what Kai was, what Kai was doing, but no, that was, it was tons of fun. And it, it, it's cool to have those experiences because you, you get to, when you go on like a tour with people who are members of the church, you, you have that shared collective spiritual experience because everyone with you also reveres these places and these people and and they respect the sacrifices of these women who buried children along the way and you know the 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 sanctity and 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 horror of places like Carthage jail so it, it's a pretty cool experience but yes I, I was in Missouri Tanner and you know I, I I thought about you while I was there I thought I'll bet Tanner would like to have this conversation about the Missouri violence here, uh, right where the Saints were getting driven out of Jackson County or in Far West or, or whatever. Well, and one of the reasons that I that I brought it up uh, here at the beginning was that we actually have received a lot of requests through emails or or messages about uh, Garrett maybe doing a tour and kind of hosting one maybe to Palmyra or, or whatever. Um, and I, I was curious, um, in, in terms of the, um, leading of a tour, Garrett, what are some of your, kind of, in terms of going to the, the sites, that's obviously the highlight, but what are some of your kind of the, the highlights or best memories in terms of things that you've done oh, or places? Man, I don't know. I mean, they're, they're, they're each one's, you know, different and there's, there's all kinds of, of special things. I mean, I don't know. I think when you go to the site of the 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 priesthood restoration um, in Harmony, I mean that there's a special feeling to know that most of the Book of Mormon's written there, right? I mean, when you go to Fayette, you feel a special feeling that this is the actual place where where the Book of Mormon translation is completed and the church is founded. Um, so, I mean, I think that uh, you know. For me, there probably really isn't anything that that's better than the the sacred grove. I mean, the sacred grove is is special. I mean, it it you go to it and you you think and reflect, and um, not every place has the same feeling. I mean, um, you know, I get a lot of mixed feelings if you if you haven't already picked that up when I go to Missouri because there's some sacred and holy things there, and then there's also Boy, a lot of pain and a lot of suffering that you've studied about, and so it kind of you kind of you kind of get both. But um, yeah, they 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 they're they're all they've all been great experiences. Well, so one one thing that 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 I wanted to, to do, and we'll put we'll put the uh, the link in the uh, the description of of this of this podcast, the Fourth of Jo uh, July Spectacular. <laughs> um, but uh, just to know if if any of the listeners would be interested in a in a uh, Doctor Dirk Matt uh, Doctor Dirk Mott, excuse me, it, it was, really does. It was Dirk Matt, and then just you, then you got me, your PhD and just, it became Dirk just Mott. Call me Al. <laughs> That's right. Well, so if there is interest, it, it'd be great, um, and and we might even be able to put something like that yeah, together I would next love summer. To, I'd love to try to you know um, take a a group of listeners or people who want to hear. I mean. Uh, that would be awesome. It's it's a it's a it's a pretty cool experience. So, you know, at least you know we can get uh, you know uh, uh, people uh, get get Brady uh, out there and <laughs> get a few people out there that we know, and that'd be tons of fun. Well, so then leading then into kind of the main the main topic for this particular uh, episode, what what is it that you kind of at the heart of the message that you're trying to to give here? Well, so uh, the Latter-day Saints have a kind of, um, you know, I, if you can already tell from if you've listened to our Lincoln episodes, which makes it sound like we have some kind of secret Watergate Nixon tapes, right? But if you've listened to our Lincoln episodes, you, you already know that 
the Latter-day Saints have a difficult relationship when it comes to the United States. And so sometimes, you know, I've, I've had people ask, well, when does that manifest itself most? I mean, aren't they, they patriotic Americans? Yes. I mean, one of the places we, we, we went uh, a, a few weeks ago was to Topsfield, Massachusetts, where they just dedicated the new Smith family monument. And, and there in Topsfield, uh, Joseph Smith's, you know, grandfather is, uh, one of the people who's, you know, a, a militiaman serving in the, the, the American revolution. So Joseph and early Latter-day Saints generally, they are patriotic Americans. They consider themselves Americans. In fact, they see the gospel as being a part of their Americanism. They, they see the, the, the United States as being this first land with the land of liberty. And then the Book of Mormon talking about how important religious liberty is. I mean, that the, they see a connection between their nation and their faith. So that is what is going to actually cause a great deal of growing pains for them. And, and frankly, for Joseph, it seems like he never quite fully comes to terms with just how corrupt the 19th century political system is. Joseph has a lot of faith, it seems, that at some point, somebody is going to just do the right thing and help the saints get their lands back that have been stolen in Missouri. Um prosecute people for the murders and the assaults that were committed in Missouri. And, and it seems like, you know, again, as a historian, we, we know it all, right? So we get to look back and be like, oh, I don't know why he ever thought that would work. But, you know, you, you, you look back and you, you, you say, man, I, Joseph really seemed to think that at some point, some politician would intervene and and come to the saints rescue and they look they do have occasional politicians who for a very brief time help them but no one's ever petitioning to get their land back for them no presidents mobilizing troops to take the saints back to their jackson county lands and so i wanted to talk a little bit about this the difficult nature that the saints find themselves, and I know I've shared part of this in previous podcasts, but I thought I'd go a little bit more in depth. So in 1841, so this is in Nauvoo, 1841, the the saints have the Nauvoo charter. They are rapidly expanding as a city, rapidly becoming the largest city in, in, in Western Illinois, and soon they'll be nearly the, the, the size of the largest city, Chicago, and more and more converts are coming. Uh, Joseph's already received a revelation to build the Nauvoo temple, to build the Nauvoo house and, and to establish this great city. And you get an idea of how they see what they're doing as, as intertwined with the idea of Americanism by, uh, the 4th of July celebration that they hold in 1841. And the, it's it's this massive celebration. If you've ever seen the the images of Joseph, you know, with his, you know, he, he's on the the, the horse outside. You know, it's, it's supposedly an image of this, you know, this reviewing of the Nauvoo Legion during this time, right? And you know, there are state legislature late legislators who come for the celebration. They fire cannons off. The Nauvoo Legion drills around, and and there are all kinds of speeches that are made all about patriotism. In fact, Joseph is going to speak, and and according to uh, the Nauvoo Legion records, um, Joseph strongly testified of his regard for our national welfare and his willingness to lay down his life in defense of his country, and he closed with these remarkable words. I would ask no greater boon than to lay down my life for my country. So you have Joseph openly stating that he'd be willing to die for the United States. Uh, this celebration is actually on the 3rd of July. Um, occasionally I will hear uh, people very upset, you know, living in Utah. I don't know why we don't celebrate the 4th of July on the 4th of July. That's ridiculous. It's only because they're Mormons. Actually, it's, it was a very common practice in 19th century America to not celebrate it when the 4th of July, 
landed on a Sunday that you celebrated either on the third or on the fifth. Um, and that's what's going on here. This is the fourth of July lands on a Sunday. So they're having their celebration on, on the third. Um, at any rate, um, uh, so you, you really have this strong, powerful, um, patriotic fervor in, in 1838 in Missouri, they hold a huge 4th of July celebration. They cut down a pole. They, 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 um, give speeches ab about the country in, in many respects, the celebration of the 4th of July is a way of demonstrating, even though they're this hated religious minority group, it's a way of Latter-day Saints to participate in the culture of America. And, and it's also what they'd already done their whole lives. Now, of course, as more and more British converts arrive, you know, probably many of them in Nauvoo are, aren't, you know, super excited about celebrating the 4th of July. That's not, not a huge holiday in Great Britain, if you're wondering. Um, although we did steal the song, the, 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 the music, you know, uh, uh, my country tis of thee, right. From, from God save the King. So it's, it makes sense that uh, we could at least play that and they, they might think that we're celebrating monarchism. But um, at any rate, Joseph and the Latter-day Saints generally certainly see the problems in the American, uh, in the American political landscape, but they also believe that, that things are going to, to change. And so it, it's an interesting turn of events from 1841 really 1841 is 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 kind of like the last hurrah of hope for the saints in the united states it's while nauvoo is still building it's after the horrors of missouri it's while the the politicians in illinois are still friendly disposed at least many of them towards the saints because they want their democratic votes but before you really start to hit some headwinds in 1842. 1842 is a year of multiple large apostasies, including John C. Bennett's and all kinds of slander that's put out by the church. It's also the same year that Wilburn Boggs, the former governor of Missouri who issued the extermination order, he's going to be shot and Porter Rockwell, as we've talked about on a previous episode, is going to be accused of that murder. But Joseph is also going to be indicted by Missouri for essentially ordering Rockwell to murder him. Now, there's no evidence of any of this at all, except for John C. Bennett saying, oh, yes, Joseph did that. I mean, a lot of hearsay evidence. But Missouri, desperate to hide and and get out from behind this, this kind of growing negativity surrounding what happened to the Mormons in Missouri. As the years go by and more and more understanding comes of just how violent and awful the expulsion of the Mormons was, the more Missouri doesn't look very good. So indicting Joseph Smith is a way of kind of resetting that, that, that public relations campaign. Because if Joseph's guilty of trying to murder Lilburn Boggs, well then all the things we ever said about the Mormons and all the things we ever did to the Mormons, including stealing all of their land, well that was justified because the Mormons are a bunch of murderers that 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 need to be dealt with. And Joseph's going to spend the next year dodging, you know, attempts to extradite him, uh, to be kidnapped, to be drugged back to Missouri. And, and for some crazy reason, Joseph thinks if he goes back to Missouri, he might be ordered to be shot. And so, you know, 1841 is, is really this, it's, it's almost like this high point before you start to go down towards this, uh, the, the events that will eventually all spiral into Joseph Smith being murdered at Carthage. But Joseph still seems to believe that at some point, some politician is going to intervene because he believes in, in American democracy. That belief, as we talked about um, in Joseph Smith's election campaign episodes, so if you haven't heard that one, you might want to go back and listen to that. Um, or I can give you the, the Cliff Notes version. Joseph Smith ran for president. And one of the reasons why he did was because he wanted to bring attention to the plight of the Latter-day Saint cause. But even in that, that presidential campaign, even when Joseph is essentially running as a third party, as a protest movement against uh, the other political parties of the day, 
What, how does Joseph open that? He opens it with a call to the most iconic American document that exists, which actually isn't the Constitution. Yes, Americans love the Constitution, but the Declaration of Independence is the document that people have memorized. Outside of the first and second amendment of the Constitution, most Americans probably can't quote very many parts of the Constitution anyone or the preamble to the Constitution. But almost every American knows the words that Joseph quotes when he opens his presidential campaign. He says, My cogitations like Daniel's have for a long time troubled me when I viewed the condition of men throughout the world, and more especially in this boasted realm, where the Declaration of Independence, quote, holds these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. But at the same time, some two or three millions of people are held as slaves for life because the spirit of them is covered with a darker skin than ours. I mean, Joseph's very bold proclamation against slavery in his presidential campaign also shows that Joseph is not protesting against the United States. He's quoting from the Declaration of Independence because what his protest is, is that Americans aren't living up to the standards of the document that was created. And he's pointing out the hypocrisy that's there. Here's the hypocrisy. Your founding document says we are all equal and you hold three million people in chains. So I guess we're not all equal, are we? Right? He, he He's not hating what the United States idea is, he's hating the fact that we have politicians who are so feckless and leaders who are so spineless that they're unwilling to do what's right for lack of popular appeal. I mean, look, it's really, really popular in America today to have a problem with slavery. I know we all want to believe that in the 1840s, Most Americans also had a problem with slavery. And historians would tell you that that's just not true. Yes, there are some incredible men and women who are abolitionists and are helping on the Underground Railroad and are adamant and opposed to slavery. And they are the smallest fraction of a minority in 1840 in the United States. So the reality is politicians didn't act on slavery because it wasn't popular to do so, or because they were afraid of what might happen if they did. So Joseph is is quoting from this founding document in the United States to point out some of the problems with it. Now, of course, Joseph has already made the decision. He's not planning on winning the campaign. He's already made the decision that, in fact, the Latter-day Saints are not going to be able to get freedom of religion, freedom from mobbing, freedom to, to practice the religion as they please inside the United States. So in 1841, Joseph is leading this gigantic Independence Day bash. By 1844, um, Joseph is running for president on a protest candidacy, protesting the, the failure of American democracy to live up to its ideals. Now, Joseph's never going to get to see the end of that campaign. In fact, it's, it's that summer that delegates are supposed to meet in Baltimore to determine whether or not they elect Joseph to be their, their candidate for his, his uh, reform party that he's launched because Joseph is going to be murdered before anyone will get to see how that campaign would have fared. And he's going to become the first declared presidential candidate in American history to be murdered. Um, and that's, it's interesting that that's actually how his murder is reported by some newspapers is as an awful assassination, which has more political connotations than, than just a murder. Um, Joseph in February of 1844 writes in his journal, I instructed the 12 to send out a delegation and investigate the locations of California and the scribe, here began to write Mexico, but then kind of crossed it out and wrote 
Oregon and Oregon to find a good location where we can remove after the temple is completed and build a city in a day and have a government of our own in a healthy climate. So by February 20th of 1844, Joseph has already, they've not already made that decision. He's, he's sending out a delegation or they intend to send out a delegation at any rate to go find a new place to, to live outside of the United States. So that's, that's where the Quorum of the Twelve is at. It's where the leadership of the church is at. Joseph's running for president in the short term, but in the long term, we've got to get out of Dodge. We, we can't let the sun go down on us here. We've got, to, we've got to find somewhere else to live that's safe. And the, the aftermath of Joseph's murder does nothing to convince the saints that Joseph was wrong about feeling like they needed to leave. In fact, uh, only a few short months after Joseph is murdered, the state is going to rescind the Nauvoo Charter. Now, what does that mean? It means that the second largest city in the state of Illinois no longer had the ability to field its own police force or to raise taxes for the various goods and services that the town provided. They rescinded that charter, and Nauvoo became an unincorporated part of Hancock County. Now, of course, you know uh, opponents of the Nauvoo Charter and the power of the Latter-day Saints had in, in Nauvoo you know, applauded this, ah, that we don't have to worry about the dreaded Nauvoo Legion anymore. That same Nauvoo Legion, by the way, that the governor had been worried about, but that actually hadn't done anything after Joseph was murdered, right? It's it's a very interesting thing that in the violence in in Illinois, it's always the Mormons that are the real threat, but somehow they're not the ones killing people, right? The Mormons are the threat. The Mormons are the threat. They're just not the ones dying. Similarly in Missouri, you know, uh, yeah, there's there's fighting on both sides, Mormons and and non Mormons, and there are Mormons killed and there are mobbers killed uh, it, at the Battle of Crooked River. But there's only one Hans Mill massacre, and it's not perpetrated by the Latter-day Saints. It's perpetrated by the state militia, the the Livingston County militia of the state of Missouri. So it's it's kind of a, a, a... a tired thing that people do when we're talking about conflicts in the past to say, well, you know, there were faults on both sides. There's always going to be some kind of fault on both sides, but there's also a disproportionate level of power. There's also uh, an asymmetry of power. You might call it where one side has all of it. And the other side that doesn't have it, isn't sure what to do about it. If you've petitioned, <clears throat> well, if you've bought your land legally and the state government is the one that recognized that you own that land and then a mob comes and drives you off of it with a gun and no judge and no police force and the governor refused to give you your lands back, what exactly do you have as a recourse? Well, you might start to yell and holler and say, I hate these Missourians. What have they done taking our land? Well, does that get your land back for you? No. Does it make the Missourians hate you more? Yes. But it doesn't actually make anything better. And the the, the Latter-day Saints find themselves in the same position of hated minority groups everywhere. When they are when you are a minority that is despised by the majority, you don't really have a recourse. You can petition the government, but the government is of course peopled by that majority. If you go out, if your petitions are going to be rejected, of course, because the majority runs that government. So then you can start to protest. But the very act of protesting against the government and its actions is taken as further proof by the majority that you weren't good citizens in the first place. In which case, if you go through official channels, nothing will be done. And if you go unofficially in protest, nothing will be done. And you'll continue to be hated by that majority or even more so. And that is exactly the position that the Latter-day Saints find themselves in after Joseph Smith's 
murder. Things don't get better. In fact, it, it almost emboldens the antagonists. You know, some people who thought that, you know, Mormonism would just dis- disintegrate and fade away were pretty disappointed to find that, in fact, the Latter-day Saints still plan to uh, stay in, in the state. Now, they were, of course, making plans to leave, but they, they hadn't left yet. And so right after the Nauvoo charters rescinded in January of 1845, Brigham Young will will say, the nation has severed us from them in every respect and made us a distinct nation just as much as the Lamanites. And it's my prayer that we may soon find a place where we can have a home and live in peace according to the law of God. I hope to find a place where no self-righteous neighbors can say that we are obnoxious to them. This uh, idea that, that Brigham Young has that we're going to find a place where there isn't other uh, other people is really that driving force like we talked about in that exodus. In fact, um, as the time goes on, as they get closer to that exodus, as they get closer to the summer of 1845, Brigham Young is going to reiterate this in, in the Council of 50 Minutes. He's going to say, The Gentiles have rejected the gospel. They've killed the prophets. And those who have not taken an active part in the murder all rejoice in it and say amen to it. And that is saying that they are willing the blood of the prophets should be shed. The Gentiles have rejected the gospel. And where shall we go to preach? We cannot go anywhere but to the house of Israel or to to the American Indians, is what he's saying. We can't get salvation without it. We can't get salvation anywhere else. He reiterated that the Mormons needed to, quote, get out of the jurisdiction of the United States. So it kind of gives you an idea of where they're at. He'll, in fact, tell the members of the Council of 50 when they're saying, well, how far do we need to go? Brigham will say, if we can get 100 miles beyond the jurisdiction of the United States, we're safe for the present, and that is all we ask. We want to get between some of those mountains where we can fortify ourselves and erect the standard of liberty on one of the highest mountains we can find. That feeling is is what people are going to feel in Nauvoo as the summer of 1845 grows on and as you come closer to the Independence Day of 1845. Now, it's not going to be that surprising that Independence Day was kind of skipped over in 1844 because it was right on the heels of the the, the murder of Joseph. Joseph's murdered June 27th, and it's only a, a few days later that you have the Independence Day. And, and there really isn't any discussion of celebrating it, of course. But what's going to happen as you approach July 4th, 1845? Well, the Latter-day Saints will find themselves in a very hostile state in a nation that is not in any way helping them. They have not only had their lands stolen from them in Missouri and people murdered, now you have threats of further extermination that are coming from Illinois, but also that are agreed upon by other people. So, for instance, there's a New York newspaper in 1845 that will say it is not very likely that these creatures can ever muster strength enough to do anything very alarming to the peace of the whole country speaking about mormons but they are likely enough to make mischief to their near neighbors and we are ourselves of the opinion that they will never rest quiet till they commit some overact of outrage formidable enough to earn themselves a sound thrashing by military force they only have the force prob- the only force probably that will even have much effect on them for they seem to entertain very loose notions on everything in the shape of merely civil and legal authority a band of ignorant fanatics like these mormons ought to be well watched and not to be permitted to gather too dangerous a head in the very midst of a more rational and civilized society we have no doubt that they have in some instances been misused by those who surround them. But making the best estimate that can be made of their character, they are a disgusting and troublesome band of absurd fanatics, and we do not wonder at the feeling that is enlisted against them by their neighbors. So here, this newspaper 
is actually acknowledging that the Latter-day Saints have been wronged, actually acknowledging that the violence that's being enacted against them is not appropriate, but then immediately justifies that violence by saying, well, I mean, what do you expect their neighbors to do? I mean, they're crazy. Uh, I mean, that's probably what I'd like to name a book, actually. Disgusting and Troublesome Band of Absurd Fanatics. If I ever if I ever own a baseball team, that's what I'd like to name them. Maybe maybe we see if we can get that into the uh, on the books. But the the reality is, the Latter Day Saints are hated. They feel that hatred, and it's coming from all places in the country. It's not just what people think about them. I mean, you're probably thinking as you listen. Well, I don't know if Latter Day Saints are too terribly loved now. Yeah, but. The, it's not just this feeling that people don't like Mormons. It's also that they are on a political level having people refuse to even enforce the laws. Are any of Joseph's murderers, are any of Hiram's murderers convicted? No. But but boy, we'll, we'll sure make sure that we indict the people who destroyed that Nauvoo expositor. That, now that's the crime that we need to make sure is prosecuted to the fullest extent. But murder, eh, what's a little bit of Mormon murder among friends, basically, right? So this sentiment is actually captured by non-Latter-day Saints. Minor Deming, who is the non-Latter-day Saint Sheriff of Hancock County throughout 1845. And throughout 1845, the violence against the, the Mormons is just growing and growing and growing. Deming is a religious man himself. He's not a Latter-day Saint. He doesn't want to become a Latter-day Saint. But having been elected to this office, he's just stunned at how ridiculously the Mormons are being treated. And so he's going to write a letter to his parents in July of 1845, where he explains the things that are going on. He writes to him, the mob party that murdered the Smiths in jail tried and hoped to burn out and expel the Mormon population of the county, amounting to about 12 or 15,000 people with their friends and its political influences makes a violent, desperate, and lawless faction. The mob, with their friends make a, uh, and political influence, make a violent, desperate, and lawless faction. These men have declared that they will not regard law, and so they beat, threaten, insult, and injure whom they choose with impunity. So in the summer of 1845, if you're a Latter-day Saint living in Nauvoo, your prophets have been murdered, your lands have been stolen in Missouri. You have threats of extermination coming not just from newspapers in Illinois, but also from newspapers in New York saying that only a military thrashing will do. You have the politicians in Illinois that have completely abandoned you. You have the, the executive office of the United States seemingly unwilling to care at all about this violence being perpetrated. And then you have the 4th of July, come rolling around. In George A. Smith's journal, he writes about the 4th of July. He said that he spent it writing, uh, spent it visiting my friends, and then uh, said, wrote, no noise or firing of guns in the city. You went from Nauvoo having this spectacular Independence Day bash every year to... July 4th of 1845, silence. In fact, George A. Smith will go on to make a commentary in his journal that, in fact, he heard that there was a terrible accident in one of the surrounding counties where there was a cannon that exploded and, and that a man was, was injured by it. Cannons did explode uh, in the 19th century. They didn't have the best OSHA standards, uh, honestly. And, and uh, when you know, those cannons were, were formed, they, they could either through overuse or for being treated badly, you know, develop a crack in them, or they could load them improperly you know, and, and they could explode. And, and when they did, of course, the cannon then became shrapnel. It was very dangerous. Uh, happened lots of times during the American Civil War. But he tells the story of this cannon being uh, exploding because he says that it's one of the cannons that 
were confiscated from the Latter-day Saints last year um, and stolen by the mob. And they went to fire off one of these Mormon cannons and it blew up. So I, he's seeing it as kind of some poetic justice. That was what a lot of communities did. You know, they didn't have a, as many fireworks celebrations, but you know, you don't need a black cat bottle rocket when you have a six pounder cannon. You just load that up and boom. And, and, um, and that's how you'd celebrate. There'd be firing of guns and cannons to celebrate the 4th of July. That's why um, George A. Smith makes such a particular mention of the fact that the city was silent. There wasn't any celebrating like that. Uh, I've read to you her letter before, but Irene uh, Haskell writes to her parents and she makes it very explicit that the fact the Latter-day Saints didn't celebrate the 4th of July was because they didn't feel like there was anything to celebrate. The 4th of July has just passed and I suppose there were balls and tea parties and the like in the East, but here there was nothing of the kind. The Mormons think the liberty and independence of the United States has been too long trampled upon to be celebrated. This uh, idea of, of, of not celebrating the 4th of July is something that is repeated um, in the Nauvoo Neighbor, the church newspaper, on the 9th of July. So many accidents having been perpetrated up to the Latter-day Saints for the past 15 years that independence, in quotes, Uh, or as it is commonly called, the 4th of July, had very few charms as a nation's holiday or a patriotic holiday. The extermination from Missouri, the assassination at Carthage of Joseph and Hiram Smith with impunity, the repeal of our city charter by might to rob us of right, gave the noise of shouting and the firing of cannon throughout the nation the appearance of a great gun that had been fired for joy a long while ago but is now silent. Here you can you can tell that the Nauvoo neighbor is, is, is trying to make clear the point. Hey, we used to celebrate this day more than anybody did. But listen to what has happened to us just in the past seven, eight, nine years. Truly, we have entered upon the 70th year of liberty or Republican administration of government. But from the intestine commotions and divisions Religious and political, we may safely quote the psalmist's words, The days of our years are threescore years and ten, and if by reason of strength they be fourscore years, yet it is their strength, labor, and sorrow, for it is soon cut off, and we fly away. Who knoweth the power of thine anger? Even according to they, they fear, so is thy wrath. The United States is, in comparison, a poor, weak, old man in his 70th year, adjusting his spectacles to read the fires, murders, storms, and calamities with which a just God is vexing his prodigal now. It was once said, every heart knows its own sorrow. But while we, as a people and a portion of this government, are witnesses of the disease that is wasting the whole nation, who saved the saints? Acknowledge that the sweeper is at the door. You can see there that that they see the United States as essentially fallen and into disrespair. That that idea of the the seventy year old man is weak and looking at his spectacles, um, and and that terminology, the phraseology in the Navu neighbor, that a just God is vexing his prodigal now. The Latter-day Saints in 1845 see the United States as having been a great land that had a noble birthright and having thrown it away over politics, over money, over whatever, but having cast aside that birthright just like the prodigal son who said, give me my money now and spent his strength with harlots, right? Um, that's that's their view. So it, it seems to be a, an almost coordinated thing in Nauvoo in 1845 that they weren't going to celebrate the 4th of July. Now, what happens, of course, is that that lack of celebration, that silent protest, they, they, 
They don't go around attacking other people and saying, what are you doing? Celebrating the 4th of July. They're not burning flags in Main Street. They simply do nothing. And what happens? Well, there are multiple newspapers that decide to take notice. The same newspapers who couldn't be bothered with the fact that people are being murdered and houses are being burned down. We're not going to report on that. But boy, they sure can report on things going on in the Nauvoo area of Illinois when it's not celebrating the 4th of July. The St. Louis New Era reported, 4th of July in Nauvoo. We are informed by a gentleman who spent the birthday of American independence in that city of fanatics that no notice whatever was taken of it. The usual business of the place was carried on without interruption. A large number of persons were at work on their holy temple on that day, and our informant inquired of some of the principal ones, why was the day not observed? Their reply was that they considered this no land of freedom, but of despotism, and besides, they had no part or lot in the government. So, Garrett, uh, that's the second time the word fanatics is used. I assume that they're referencing the, the baseball, Philadelphia, yeah, the yeah, baseball yeah. mascot. Yeah, they're they're big they're big Philadelphia Phillies fans. You know, they just they're so excited. They they knew that one day they'd they'd have a Latter Day Saint on the team, and so. That, yeah, that, yeah, exactly. That's they're, exactly they're why very, they're very excited about it. So, I mean, that that it seems to be used again and again. Where does it get its you know genesis? Yeah, the the term fanatic today, I mean, still has a negative connotation. I mean, outside of of outside of being a Phillies fan, it 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 has a negative connotation. But you actually most often hear it today in terms of political extremism, right? Um, but, but frankly, you know, the term fan, when it, when we talk about baseball fans comes from the term fanatic, that's, that's actually where it comes from. That's where we get, and when we say, oh, there's fans in the stands, it's these people that are, are really zealous. So if you go back to the 1828 definition, which would have been more, uh, in line with what they were talking about, you'll notice that it's, it is much more religiously based. And so these papers are making this criticism as a religious criticism. So we read the, from the Webster's Dictionary, a person affected by excessive enthusiasm, particularly on religious subjects, one who indulges in wild and extravagant notions of religion and sometimes exhibits strange motions and postures and vehement vociferation in religious worship. Fanatics sometimes affect to be inspired or to have intercourse with superior beings. Well, boy, that... It's almost like he wrote that after the church was founded in 1830 as a way of describing it. They're claiming they have, you know, it, it kind of gives you an idea of just how closed many 19th century Americans think the heavens are, that the definition of someone who's a fanatic is someone who claims that they've had conversation with, with superior beings. So, but yeah, these newspapers are using that as in the most derogatory way possible, that they, they have a fanatical zeal. Um, but you, you, you'll already notice that the Latter-day Saints decided that they weren't going to celebrate the 4th of July as a silent protest of how horribly they'd been treated. The response from the St. Louis New Era isn't to say, man, I mean, I know we've been treating these people bad, but I, di I didn't know it was that bad. But it's instead to say, huh, this is perfect proof of what terrible people they are. I, I always knew they were terrible. Now I know how terrible they are. Here's another one uh, from the Galena Gazette. After uh, criticizing the Mormons' failure to properly celebrate the 4th of July, this paper wrote, Yet these men hold the controlling potential influence in this congressional district. Because, again, politics, you know, it's hard to imagine a world where people would hate one another on the basis of how they vote alone. But imagine that world where someone could care so much about politics that you would hate another human being because they don't agree with you on it. But in the Galena Gazette's world, that is a big deal. What's the real problem with the Mormons? Well, they're going to vote in this congressional district. We're going to let these people vote. Um, these men hold the controlling potential influence in this congressional district. 
and the last two elections the member now representing us was elected by their votes. How highly must the elective franchise be prized when the will of the people can be counteracted by an influence such as this? It is strange that laws should be disregarded and trampled underfoot as they have been recently when those who make and execute our laws receive their power from such hands. Well, here the Galena Gazette is is turning it around the other way. How is it possible that we keep getting a Democrat as a representative instead of a Whig because we let these crazy Mormons vote? These same Mormons who don't even respect our country enough to celebrate the 4th of July properly. Now, of course, the Mormons had been celebrating the 4th of July properly. In fact, they'd been celebrating with such a gusto that one of the things that first causes Thomas Sharp of the Warsaw Sentinel to become worried about the growing power of Nauvoo is he attends one of these 4th of July celebrations and decides that they're far too fanatical. And and this is one of the things that sets him on the road towards his overt anti-Mormonism. The Latter-day Saint response to these, you know, these papers that were acting outraged that the Mormons weren't properly celebrating the 4th of July the way they should is, um, I mean, it's, there's there's a, enough sarcasm here uh, to you know if it were were fertilizer it could turn the Sinai Desert you know into you know the Snake River Plain in Idaho. I mean it, uh, it. There's a lot of sarcasm. This is the response. The above quills of the inner man pricking through the hypocrite's hides make the saints feel all over. After having been robbed of one or two millions of dollars worth of property, been murdered and exterminated by executive authority from the, quote, independent republic of Missouri, and after having had a city charter either given or taken surreptitiously, besides the martyrdom of two of their best men, while under the plighted faith of the state, Yea, verily, the celebration of the 4th of July heretofore more than any other people and throughout the Union except Nauvoo. The past anniversary by the Mormons is all chaff, stealthily forcing our guns from us in Missouri and taking the state arms and cannon from us in Illinois, so that had the pimps of the New Era and the Gazette and those in juxtaposition their mind, we might celebrate the 4th of July with pop guns, vote as they say for nabobs to rule over us, and please to the last we crop the flowing food and lick the hand that just raised to shed our blood. Crying, freedom, freedom, oh, the blessings of liberty. If you lynch men to death at Vicksburg for gambling, or burn a Negro alive in St. Louis, or massacre men for being Catholics and foreigners in Philadelphia, it is all in the way of independence. So I I feel like uh, you you need to defend or define a a word there. Um, I'm speaking, obviously, of nabobs. (laughs) I thought you were going to have me define pimps. No, I am. Uh, okay, well, 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 you know, w- let's define both just for everybody. The nabob, of course, is just, uh, it's a reference to uh, a sub prince in India, you know, a wealthy prince. And so it's usually used in, in this kind of pejorative as a as an aut- autocratic person, right? So the, the na- you'll, you'll have us vote for someone who isn't going to actually be a enforce the rules of democracy that's that's the point of that the pimps well um uh well it has the same definition that as it does now essentially this is uh, yes uh, someone who is selling things all right certain things um so that had the pimps of the new era and the gazette and those in juxtaposition in their mind i i love the response here is you took our cannons from us. You took our guns from us. And now you're complaining that we're not celebrating the 4th of July by firing off our guns and our cannons that you stole from us. Do you want us to celebrate it with pop guns? What, what do you want us to do? And then, you know, very, you know, to kind of give a poignancy to the fact that, 
This isn't just a Mormon problem in the United States. It is a problem of the tyrannical Protestant majority, the Protestant white majority. That, that's what was that's what stood out to me. It was interesting. They listed several grievances yeah. of other and, groups. And these, these are things that had all just recently occurred that they're reading in the newspapers. They are things that are outside of the realm of justice, right? You're going to lynch a man to death in Vicksburg for gambling. What does that mean? Did, did he have a trial? Is, is, is the punishment of death what's meted out for gambling? Nope. But guess what got meted out to that guy? Death, right? Burn a Negro alive in St. Louis. So, so, so some black man is, is murdered by a, a mob in, in St. Louis and Missouri. And of course, that doesn't matter. Or the massacre of men for being Catholics and foreigners. It's not just Catholics and other religion, but also foreigners. Most of the foreigners at this time that they're going to be talking about are primarily um, going to be both Irish immigrants who are coming, then also some Germans, right? That they're, they're rejected as not being true Americans and therefore not entitled to the protection of the law. The, the writer of this is making a very clear connection that there's a sickness inside the American democracy. That sickness is that only the rights of the Protestant white majority are going to be defended. The laws only exist to protect those who are in the majority. And if you happen to be a Catholic, or if you happen to be an immigrant, or if you happen to be black, or if you happen to be a Mormon, you, you, you'll be lucky if those laws ever apply equally to you. And, and so the Latter-day Saints find out through their 4th of July protest what, um, what minority groups have often found out uh, throughout the history of the United States. And that is that there actually isn't an effective way to protest your ill treatment at the hands of the majority. If you do nothing, if you just let all the violence pass over you, you let all the injustices, you let the, 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 the many murders go by without any indictments, you let the destruction and stealing of property to go without any repercussion, well, then nothing happens. No one's ever prosecuted. Everyone just says, you're fine, you're fine. I think you're overreacting. If you do protest in any way that catches notice of the majority, they then turn around and attack you further for being a bad American for the very fact that you protested. It's really a no-win situation for these despised groups that are in the minority. If they do nothing, their treatment never changes. If they protest, the very fact that they're protesting is proof to the majority that they are the terrible people we already thought they were. And so there's a reason why Latter-day Saints, when they leave the United States, they're not leaving crying as they leave the land of their, you know, their, their first inheritance. Yeah, they're Americans, many of them, although there are many uh, uh, British converts by that point. And of course they miss their families. Of course they don't want to leave the country. But like Orson Pratt said in his last address that he published before they left, he was happy to go because he would rather die in the wilderness than to be destroyed by these mobs in this supposed land of liberty. The Latter-day Saints find out that they aren't able to get freedom of religion inside the United States. And when they try to protest the treatment that they've received, not by, you know, going and setting fire to the state house in Springfield, but just by not celebrating the way the rest of the people around them are, they're immediately attacked as being even greater traitors than we ever thought they were. Now, I'm not saying that people can't celebrate the 4th of July. We, if you're wondering, we do again begin uh, celebrating the 4th of July when we get to Utah territory. Um, and the Latter-day Saints have a history of celebrating the 4th of July 
to various degrees all the way up through to the present. But this is an, an interesting historical example of when Latter-day Saints as a community said, we are not going to celebrate a nation which refuses to recognize the laws of the country. We're not going to celebrate the independence of a nation that is murdering our people and refusing to enforce the laws. So hopefully everyone got a nice little tidbit there. You, you're, you're, you're still welcome to celebrate the 4th of Happy July. Happy 4th of July, Happy, everybody. Now look, we're, we will also be celebrating. My dad, you know, the I- irony of this is my dad loved the 4th of July. It was his favorite holiday. He loved 4th of July and Christmas. My dad was born in another country. He was born in the Netherlands uh, in, in Nazi-occupied Holland. Um, and I don't know if that was uh, it, but I, I think so. He just had a, a a profound love of of the United States. He loved it. He loved it to the point where he felt it was disrespectful if people wore like an American flag T-shirt because that that's the flag of this country, and you're going to spill your hot dogs ketchup on it. You know what I mean? Like that that flags aren't to be worn. Flags are flown, and he put a flag pull up at our house and he would dutifully, you know, put up and take down that flag. And so I, the point of this, this uh, wasn't to say, oh, no one should celebrate because there've been horrible things that have happened in the United States. There's obviously been some wonderful things that have happened in the United States as well. And despite the horrors that the Latter-day Saints went through, in the end, this did seem to be the land, the only land at the time that God could have reestablished his church in. So you know, that, that there's positives and there's negatives, but it, it is important to take that perspective, especially if you're going to study 19th century history. Otherwise, you might not understand why when you read Brigham Young's journals from 1845, he's not trying to plan out how he can buy more fireworks for the great celebration they're about to have, because he's too busy trying to figure out how can I build more wagons to get the poor people out of Nauvoo because we're being exterminated from the state of Illinois? And, and I, I think it's always important to, to take a step back and to realize that just because you might have a certain experience with the nation doesn't mean that every other person at every other time in American history has had that experience. Latter-day Saints should be especially sympathetic to people who feel like they're being abused by the government. We should feel that way because we have a long history of having been the objects of that abuse. And hopefully that causes us to be sympathetic and, and willing to hear, at least hear out what it is that these other people are saying is is happening to them so thank you for joining us uh next week we'll 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 find some other holiday what's coming up next can we find another holiday to talk about uh well pioneer day well we won't do that one well maybe we will yeah should we do that one yeah that'd be great that we should do what causes uh the runaway officials issue in uh uh, in Utah Territory. Oh, I think the people cry out for they that. Cry, they cry out. As my brother says, the people cry out. Well, thank you so much for listening. Thank you for listening to the Standard of Truth podcast, hosted by historian Dr. Garrett Dirkmott. If you know anybody that could benefit from the material in this episode, please share it with them. And for more resources, visit standardoftruth.com. Until next time.